Hello and welcome to Business Today. I'm Abha Bakaya. The Adani Enterprises follow-on public offer has received bids worth 50.81 million shares against an offer size of 45.5 million shares. What does this amount to? The offer stands fully subscribed at 1.12 times on the final day of bidding. We'll get you more on this, but for now, let's shift focus to the big headline of the day, the pre-budget economic survey. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman tabled the pre-budget economic survey in the Lok Sabha. Let's take our viewers through a quick cheat sheet of the key highlights from the all-important survey. The survey forecasts a baseline GDP growth of 6.5% in FY24. Even with lower growth forecasts for the next fiscal versus the current one, the pace would still make India's growth the fastest among the bigger economies. Growth for the current fiscal is pegged at 7% versus 8.7% in FY22. GDP growth for year 23-24 is seen at 6 to 6.8 percent. Private consumption and capital formation top the list of growth drivers. On the CAPEX front, Ministry believes that private CAPEX needs uh, to assume a leadership role as we move forward towards the new fiscal. The government-motivated CAPEX is also expected to drive economic growth between 2022 to 23. According to the survey, India's current account deficit may widen due to high global commodity prices. However, amid all this optimism, the finance ministry has flagged concerns on the rupee, saying it will continue to remain under depreciation pressure. Now let's shift focus to the big interview of the day. My colleague and Business Today Managing Editor Siddharth Zarabi sat down with the Chief Economic Advisor V. Ananta Nageshwaran on what he makes of India's growth and lots more. Listen in. You look at the uh, actual growth outcomes, 8.7, and estimated for this year by NSO is around 7. And then you take a look at, for example, the projections made by many international organizations. It is either somewhere in the region between 6.1 to 6.6 percent. And next year, according to the IMF 24-25, talking about the year after the next financial year, 23-24, 6.8 in 24-25. So clearly we are now looking, putting the putting the recovery from the pandemic behind us and looking ahead to a period of what the trend growth will be. And, and many people are projecting that the Indian economy will grow at a trend rate of 6%. That is what their projection is. All I'm saying is the trend growth is probably higher than that. And that is because of the fact that India has done a, a repair of many balance sheets, banking, non-banking, corporate, and second, the public digital infrastructure that we have put together are all, is also creating opportunities for many micro and small businesses to grow. So taken together, these two developments, which were not there in the last decade, the, the, uh, uh, bank, the cleaner balance sheets and public digital infrastructure together will give us a higher growth rate than the trend growth of 6%, which is what is there in the projections of many organizations and the private sector. That is the uh, highlight of the survey. The estimate is 6 to 6.8 with a baseline uh, number of 6.5%. Uh, we've been talking to um, others in the field and they are saying the scenario is more likely towards 6 rather than 6.5 or 6.8. No, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to these point estimates, we need to uh, understand that economic forecasts are at best conditional statements. You make certain assumptions. Obviously, when these assumptions, are, if the assumptions materialize, hopefully your forecast will materialize because it is subject to so many influences, domestic, external, etc. That is why the range is important. We, we have also acknowledged in the survey that the downside risks are slightly higher than the upside to our baseline number of 6.5%. However, if some of the uh, adverse developments that could come, if they don't come, such as higher commodity price, further interest rate increases in the United States, and further strength in the U.S. dollar, and uh, overall uh, uh, cost of living increases, uh, in the Western world, leading to higher rates and higher commodity prices translating into a higher import bill, etc. If those kinds of things don't materialize, then I think the chances of us achieving 6.5 are better increase. So that is why I said economic forecasts are conditional statements. We just need to understand 
what the overall trend is and numbers give us a false sense of precision okay uh, uh, you spoke about the downside uh, uh, risks and that is a point uh, well taken because we live in a significantly uncertain global macro uh, environment and many of the things that we have witnessed post covid uh, there are lingering uh, effects what are the positive uh, upsides as far as the indian economy are concerned as you look ahead uh, into the year no i mean the positive factors are what i mentioned which is that the momentum in the economy is still good second credit growth is in double digits and if you look at the purchasing managers indices they are in expansion territory and if you look at the first half gdp growth numbers private consumption and capital formation are doing quite well and private sector capital formation based on data they submit in the earnings reports is also higher than what it was in the previous financial year and overall exports both goods and services together in the first 9 months of the year is running at 16% above the previous years april to december 2021 so i think if you put all these things together along with the fact that corporates in general are feeling confident and uh, unbeknownst to us uh, which we are so far not measured rigorously the contribution that is made by digitization is increasing formalization and financial inclusion contributing to more economic activity and also efficient economic activity all these factors are positive drivers of economic growth not only in the present not only for the next financial year but beyond as well uh infrastructure and a capex boost uh and the government has really taken on a lot of the uh sort of responsibility in that regard you also made the point about private uh investment government government and private what will drive growth in the year ahead in terms of capital formation or investments yes mean? yes look uh, i mean uh, public investments uh, both the center and the states and public sector enterprises put together have been rising and according to data if you take all these three entities together central state governments public sector enterprises or the union government uh, i think from what i gather uh, if i recall correctly they have gone up by about 2.8x 2.8 times in the last 8 to 9 years and that is a very big jump so naturally i think uh, what will happen is the momentum will now shift to the private sector because there has strong balance sheets good profitability and uncertainties are there but fading slowly so uh, ultimately we need both public and private sector to invest uh, just as we say in the global context uh, the emerging and developing economies need concessional financing non concessional financing private sector financing etc in the domestic context as well we need both public sector and private sector investments to continue to happen and which proportion will they be depends on the economic cycle and the context how large india's economy will be by 2030 uh, if you could please expand on that for our viewers look i mean these are again as i said with respect to the earlier question about gdp growth these point estimates are an interesting exercise but of limited utility they give us some sort of a rough idea of where we see things but they cannot be taken as precise proofs or precise guidance because ultimate outcomes are subject to many factors beyond our control so if we look at the numbers 3 and 1/2 trillion dollars will be likely size of india's gdp by march 2023 roughly there about and historically over the last 30 years india's dollar gdp has grown at the rate of 9% in spite of rupee depreciation in these 30 years and there are episodes when the rupee has strengthened and in those periods india's dollar gdp has even grown at double digit rates like for example in the first decade of the current millennium so in general if we take uh, a 10% growth rate uh, in dollar terms because let's say the us interest rate cycle peaks at some point and dollar strength also peaks at some point which probably it already has then we are we can look ahead to 10% uh, growth in india's dollar gdp and in general when you grow at 10% uh, the value doubles in about 7 years so 
if subject to a lot of assumptions if india's dollar gdp grows at 10% per annum from 2024 2023 april onwards by 2030 you could be looking at a 7 trillion dollar economy so that has also caught up with a slew of economists on the back of the economic survey and what they expect from tomorrow's budget here's a slice of that conversation I'm coming to you, uh, uh, Rahul, on that one big number, 6 to 6.8 with a baseline scenario of 6.5. Explain that to our audience. What are the finance ministry, economic service officials uh, uh, suggesting? Yeah, so uh, Siddharth, I think the number is possibly, you know, a tad bit on the higher side. I would say 6.5 is something, you know, slightly above what we think will be the growth. But... Broadly, I think it sort of paints a picture of resiliency in the domestic sector. I think one of the key messages in the in the economic survey that comes out is that from a, a financial sector perspective, you know, the leverage in India has not really uh, been increasing as has been the case with the West, but, you know, it has actually come down relative to even the 2008 scenario, you know, when uh, we had the last round of growth, uh, you know, boom, uh, which kind of ended. And so from uh, the current perspective, you know, with the headwinds of the pandemic, uh, with the headwinds, uh, even from the war and the commodity price shock sort of starting to fade through, uh, India remains in a position to kind of grow, uh, you know, at a, at a reasonably good rate of growth, uh, which can be between six to six and a half percent, you know, uh, which will be a very respectable number. And that should probably set us up, you know, for, uh, for, a, for a fairly resilient performance uh, led by private consumption and private investment, which is starting to show some very early signs of recovery. Uh, Rahul, that's a good perspective. Aurodhip Nandi, uh, uh, budget making at a time when the global environment remains significantly uncertain, although there seem to be some sort of uh, green shoots, if I may use that word, uh, on, on some of the dark clouds, if not green, at least a silver lining. Uh, what is the budget uh, making exercise really about this time around? It is, of course, this government's uh, in the current term last full budget. Uh, but keeping the political economy aside, w w what are the key challenges that you foresee? So I, I think the first big challenge is um, just the, num the optimism which the, the economic service seems to talk of that 6.5% growth for FI24, our number is much more conservative at 5.1%. Because we feel that given the, the, the kind of recession that um, is likely to happen across uh, developed markets, the hit to the Indian economy through exports, through a fall in fixed investments is going to be um, uh, quite a lot. I mean, we, we are completely on the same page in terms of all these uh, great reforms that the government of India has taken. And obviously, that's a positive medium-term story. So we expect growth to rebound in the next fiscal in FI25. But for FI24, it's going to be particularly challenging um, on the growth front. Let's also not forget that the RBI has sharply hiked its policy rates over the past few months and there will be a lag impact of this policy tightening also on um, domestic growth. Um, the, the economic service seems to talk a lot about private capex revival and hoping that that will kind of drive growth but, um, but for now this is a very uncertain environment for hoping a private capex to pick up. Shubda, uh, is the optimism with regard to growth justified? And what is the number that you are personally working with? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Siddharth. I think the one critical point is the degree of optimism and not whether it's optimism vis-a-vis -vis pessimism. So while uh, we also believe that there is a reason to be optimistic, how much of optimism should we build in given the global environment is a key question. Uh, while we are within the fan chart, if I may say so, of what the CA presented earlier in the day, uh, between 6 to 6.8, but I'm afraid we are at the lower end of the fan chart, which is at 6%, uh, and not uh, as uh, the base case scenario presented by uh, CEA at 6.5. Uh, so while growth definitely will start uh, uh, shaping up better as we see the risks, uh, particularly uh, you know coming from uh, coming out of the pandemic and some of the uh, economic shocks uh, having arisen because of war, namely uh, you know the commodity 
ID, price shocks, or the supply chain disruptions, etc. Those perhaps would be waning, and to my mind, that would be a positive factor to support India's growth. The reason why we are uh, perhaps uh, sounding less optimistic vis-a-vis -vis the 6.5% growth is on two counts. One, of course, is the solid assumption on domestic consumption. Now, we have to here segregate the consumption pattern. While the urban consumption has remained uh, fairly resilient and, in fact, looked better because of the pent-up demand and the economic conditions getting better with opening up of the economy. But at the same time, a fair bit of that domestic urban consumption has been leveraged. Interest rates having been rising over the last few quarters, could perhaps somewhat slow this leverage consumption. And as the credit numbers also point out, the credit growth has got a significant push because of the personal loans and retail loans and so on. So we, while we do see improvement in consumption, but how much of further improvement, that is a question to uh, for all okay. of us to assess. Okay. The second is, I think the CA was uh, uh, candid enough to admit that a private capex is at incipient stage. Right. Now, unless and until we see global economy stabilize, we perhaps may have to wait a couple of quarters or maybe until H2 of the fiscal 24 to see a more meaningful, broad-based private capex recovery. And for these two counts, we believe that uh, growth may actually come out at 6% and not perhaps at 6.5 as was uh, okay. taken as the base case scenario. But overall, I think there was a fair assessment by the economic survey in terms of the growth prospects going forward. Uh, of course, with the caveat that there are no further one-off kind of shocks that of course. we have seen over the past three years. But if the economy and within the global economic environment does not see any uh, e global economic shocks spilling over into the Indian economy, I think subsequent to fiscal 24, we could actually see growth getting better even around six and a half to seven percent. Okay. And I would like to stop there, maybe, uh, you know, take Yes, absolutely. A quick look at how the market fared today. Another day of choppy trade on the Lal Street. Uh, the benchmarks ended the day higher after struggling to sustain opening highs. They closed the day with minor gains, uh, the Nifty closing with gains of just about 30 odd points, settling about 17,600, Sensex ending with gains of about 50 points, pretty much flat, just below 60,000. The mid and small caps did outperform their larger peers today with gains of about a percent or so. SBI, M&M, Power Grid, Ultratech, Cement and Adani Ports, some of the gainers on the Nifty today. Among the laggards, we had names like Bajaj Finance, TCS, Tech Mahindra, Britannia and HDFC Life. The Adani Enterprises follow-on public offer has sailed through the storm created by the Hindenburg report. There were moments when it seemed that the mega 20,000 crore rupee FPO may not make it, but the issue did pass the test. Only as Business Today TV first broke the news Monday morning, the Adani issue had to be bailed out by institutional investors after small investors chose to stay away. Adani Enterprise ka FPO ek behtarin mauka hai aisi company se judne ka जिसने अपने निवेशकों का पूर्व में तो असाधारण रिटर्न दिया ही है और उसका भविष्य और भी उज्जवल है गौतम अडानी एग्जैक्टली अ वीक अगो ही हैड रिलीज्ड दिस वीडियो स्टेटमेंट हार्ड सेलिंग हिज मेगा 20,000 करोड़ रुपी अडानी एंटरप्राइजेस पब्लिक इश्यू द बिगेस्ट ऑफ इट्स काइंड इन द कंट्री the bulls at the Dalal Street had no doubt that the issue fronted by the man with the Midas touch would be a super hit. The issue opened on Friday, January 27th and had a calm weekend before the perfect storm hit on Monday, with Hindenburg releasing its report, alleging massive bungling in the Adani group. The issue was subscribed just 1% on the first day, 3% on the second, but sailed through on the third day thanks to massive support by institutional investors. At 5 p.m. today, the issue had been subscribed 112%. While small investors clearly avoided the issue, even Adani employees do not seem to be too excited about the company's prospects. It is only on the strength of qualified institutional buyers and non-institutional investors 
that the issue made it through. A lot of family offices run by uh, typically Zaidus uh, Ambani as well as by you know Sunil Mittal family have actually subscribed to this offer. Most importantly, on the domestic side, we are going to see a lot of uh, FI interest also uh, names like uh, you know Morgan Stanley. Uh, names like you know typically Aditya Birla Mutual Fund. You know these are some names which have actually uh, given their you know uh, you know given given uh, their uh, you know allocation for this uh, stock. The Adani Enterprises FPO also became an anathema for small investors because they could easily buy the share much cheaper in the open market. While the issue price band was lower than the share price last week, the Hindenburg report inspired sell-off pushed the prices well below the issue price. Bureau Report, Business Today Television. Gautam Adani was close to becoming the second richest man in the country. The Hindenburg explosion has singed the billionaire so badly he has fallen off the global top 10 rich list. Mukesh Ambani is just a couple of billion dollars below Gautam Adani and given the loss in market cap of Adani shares is all set to overtake his fellow Gujarati by tomorrow. It's one race the country loves to track. The race of wealth between the country's two richest industrialists. For the past few months, Gautam Adani has led the hustings by a wide margin. But now Mukesh Ambani is all set to edge him out. Till a couple of months ago, Gautam Adani was the second richest man in the world. And the pace of the rise in his net worth was such that he was expected to be the world's richest very soon. This was what he had to say in an exclusive interview to the India Today group. These rankings and numbers do not matter to me. These are only media hype. I'm a first generation entrepreneur who had to build everything from scratch. I get my thrills from handling challenges and the bigger they are, the happier I am. The last week of January has seen his fortunes turn. The Adani Group chairman is poorer by around 2,80,000 crore rupees in the past one week. Gautam Adani was worth $150 billion in September, just below Elon Musk in personal wealth. At the beginning of this year, his net worth had slipped to $121 billion. As of today, his wealth has been slashed to $84 billion, thanks to the impact of the Hindenburg report. He's just $2.2 billion or 18,000 crore rupees richer than Mukesh Ambani, a gap likely to be plugged by the end of the day today. Behind this spectacular fall in fortunes is a slide in the share prices of the Adani Group companies. The group has 10 listed companies. Since Thursday, when the Hindenburg report first appeared, the group has lost 5,65,000 crore rupees in market capitalization. The fall is led by Adani Total Gas, which is down nearly 2 lakh crore rupees. Adani Green Energy and Adani Transmission have also lost more than a lakh crore in value. Adani Enterprises, which is currently raising 20,000 crore rupees via an FPO, is down 53,000 crore rupees. According to the Hindenburg report, the stock price of seven listed companies of the group went up by an average of 819% over a period of three years, leaving investors wondering how much more mauling by their D Street beers will the Adani counters take. Bureau Report, Business Today Television. That's where we leave it on the show tonight, but do stay tuned for all the budget coverage right here on India Today, all day tomorrow.